you know, we're, I, I realize that what we have, uh, you know, the, the good news is there's so much going on in CLL, and so behind the scenes of the, even this meeting with the IWCLL and the sessions that go on, many of us uh, investigators, what's nice about the CLL meeting as opposed to some of our larger meetings that we have annually, such as ASH, the American Society of Hematology, um, where there's thousands because it goes over all the different blood cancers. Uh, the IWCL is always a great forum because it's all of the uh, U.S. and international based folks who just do CLL, um, who do research, whether it's clinical research, meaning running trials and finding new therapies, or basic laboratory research, so trying to find new drugs and translate them into uh, into the clinics for, for myself and, uh, to test out and try to find newer therapies. The advances in CLL in the last couple of years have been huge. And so there's a lot going on, and I think testing is uh, very important and becoming more relevant, uh, particularly because it's influencing some of our choices for therapies. Um, and I realized that even last night we were having a meeting. I was with, um, you know, the people from Germany and from Australia, that some, even some of the newer therapies are not yet approved. And I realized that there is huge disparities across the globe about access to drugs. And so this is where I think that's going to become really important because the, some of the testing really does have implications about how we're steering patients to certain therapies that we've learned. And the only way to do that is by testing and learning what we're doing uh, through, through our patients and then taking that forward as we look at new therapies. So that being said, well, disclosures, I have lots of them. <laughs> I can't do this without, uh, you know, so the research to the institution, I work with all of these companies to get new drugs for all of you folks. Ooh, does it go back? There you go. So um, uh, I'm involved with lots of different companies. Hey, Nicole. Yeah. Can you talk just a little bit slower? Sure, absolutely. But if I go over too long, because <laughs> I can talk about CLO all day, um, you're going to have to scoot me. All right. So... Just, just to give you guys a sense, and many of you have probably seen similar slides to this, that lots of therapies have evolved over the past decade or two. It's incredible. And for what we consider a relatively rare disease, you know, when we think about CLL as opposed to other solid tumor cancers, breast, lung, colon, you know, many hundreds of thousands of patients that get diagnosed every year. You know, the CLL folks, we're, you guys are rare beasts. You know, so there's, um, you know, uh, 15, you know, 20,000 in the U.S. diagnosed every year, but several hundreds of thousands of patients living with CLL. Um, so really the sort of the, the, the wonderful things that have happened is that in a short period of time, many new agents have been approved for a rare disease, and it's been really quite a remarkable journey. Um, I started um, doing clinical trials. I started working in leukemia in 2001, so that's 18 years. So I'm part of the chemoimmunotherapy generation. I ran FCR trials, so I've given all of these therapies. Um, and really to see um, what we've done in the last five years alone has really been incredible uh, for me and for my patients. And so it's really an incredible time, and so I think that should give all of you um, and the patients that you deal with, a lot of hope for the future. Really, back in the late 1990s, you know, when the antibody, when rituximab uh, first came of era, you know, we were all excited about having an antibody, and, it was a, and it's a great therapy. So rituximab was really the first of adding to sort of the backbone of the chemo, uh, in, chemotherapy drugs that we used and really made a difference. And now, fast forward to the last five, five years, and you have all these small molecule targeted therapies, uh, many of which are oral therapies that recently have been approved. So it's really, really quite an exciting time, and I'm going to go through some of the recent approvals. So again, for the last five years, we've had just several agents approved, and some of, some, some of your folks might have been, um, uh, um, have been able to, uh, or maybe on some of these therapies, some are not. Um, so obinutuzumab and chlorambucil was, you know, recently approved for frontline treatment of CLL. Abrutinib in the U.S., and again, you know, it, it's approved, but I don't know the access issues abroad are different. So again, so I know that not everybody has access to all these novel agents. So abrutinib is approved for all settings, frontline, relapsed, frail, everybody will go through that. 
Uh, idelisumab and rituximab um, is approved for the relapse for relapse patients with CLL. And then most recently, venetoclax and rituximab was approved for uh, patients who have had at least one prior therapy, so in the relapse setting. Duvalisib, so another agent approved for relapse. And then the, the latest was venetoclax and obinutuzumab. So taking venetoclax and now pushing it up front. And again, I know this is not readily available yet um, in Europe um, or the UK. This is not, uh, it, it, or Australia, this is not approved frontline uh, here. Uh, but certainly, we're already making a transition to, to these newer therapies in the US. I realize that we're much, we have, uh, the, we're much more spoiled with what we're able to do in the US compared uh, to abroad. So, but I think this is what's going to be important in Europe so we can get some of these drugs outside of being on clinical trials, which of course I think is, is wonderful for patients to be a part of clinical trials and get access to some of these new agents. But of course, you know, we want to try to get access uh, to all uh, for, for some of these new agents. We're still learning how to use these agents, so, so make, no, make no mistake about it. Um, clearly, there are challenges. So the good news is we have lots of drugs now in our armamentarium, but we're still learning how to figure out how best to use some of these new agents, how best to combine some of these new agents. So we've got a lot more to do. We are not done. Uh, you, know, you know, I like to say these are all curative, but they're not. Um, so we have a long way to go, uh, but the good news is, you know, we're getting there. So again, lots to use, a lot of hope to go forward. Next slide. Can we advance? Please. Thank you. Now too, too much. Let's see if I could do that. One back. Thank you. So traditionally, um, you know, when we looked at therapies for CLL, I'm just going to have you guys advance for me. When, uh, when we looked at therapies for CLL, most oftentimes, particularly when we talk about chemoimmunotherapy, so fludarabine, bendamustine, when we talk about those types of therapies, we were thinking about how, you know, what, what were the fitness levels of patients? What are their comorbidities? You know, what medical problems may select out uh, for patients in terms of when we're thinking about when somebody needs therapy, how does their fitness level play into that? Because remember, we had less options than we do today for patients with CLL. And so when we were choosing therapies, we were choosing amongst chemo or chemoimmunotherapy programs. And so we were trying to fit what is most appropriate for the patient based on their, on their comorbidities. Because if we give very aggressive therapy to some patients, the therapy's worse than we might. The therapy might be worse than the disease, right? We might cause a whole host of toxicities and side effects, which are you know we do not want to do, of course. And so we're we're sort of looking at folks and saying, what is okay? We're trying to obviously get a regimen or a treatment that's going to benefit all, but you have to balance that with toxicity always. And so in the era of chemoimmunotherapy, this was extremely paramount and extremely relevant. Can we advance to the next slide? Thank you. Now with these novel targeted therapies, um, a brutinib, a calibrutinib, I didn't even talk about, so the other BTK inhibitors, the PI3 kinase inhibitors, venetoclax, the BCL2 inhibitors. Now these therapies are targeted and there are less side effects, but don't get, I'm not gonna make any mistakes to say that there are no side effects, right? So all these agents have some side effects, but compared to some of the more aggressive chemoimmunotherapy programs like FCR, they're much better tolerated. Um, and so now, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an even playing field. You know, now it's not just age and comorbidities that we could separate people. Because now older people can get great therapies too. And so, you know, again, there was a, always a bias about fitness. Um, now I think we can use both. So it's not just fitness. We can get more selective. What are the side effects of some of these new novel agents? How do we, now we can use, we can look at those side effects of those agents and look at our patients and go, okay. They could still get really good new therapies, but what are the comorbidities that might influence what the drug side effects are, right? Because each of them may have different side effects. And so now I think it's not just fitness. Um, I think, uh, you know, now you guys, you know, people of all, whether young or old, fit or frail, have access to good therapies for CLL. We're still being selective, but they have good, you should all be able to get good access. It is not just if you're young, you can get FCR, if you're older, you only get chlorambucil. Okay, uh, next slide. So the, being here at the IWCLL, 
Um, we tried to provide some guidance about looking at how to personalize approach to therapy. And so this is from the working group committee from the IWCLL. And so now we look at obviously not just performance status, as I said, we're also looking at prognostic factors. And so now we're trying to say, okay, we have good therapies for CLL in the era of chemoimmunotherapy is what is you know, what therapies did we have that didn't hurt somebody or give them too much toxicity but gave some treatment for the disease. But now as we get better therapies, we can start tailoring that to different subgroups of CLL, right? So I think one of the difficulties about why, you know, we find it hard to find a cure for CLL um, uh, is that the disease is so heterogeneous, right? There's so much variability. Um, and so, you know, I like to say that CLL is not one disease. There are things we're still learning about the biology, about the disease, um, and certainly this information plays into that, and we'll learn more. So when we talk about testing, and that's my topic, when we talk about testing, I think there are certain tests that are very important. And believe me, I'm gonna show you some data. I recognize that this isn't all necessarily routine or available for everybody, but I think some of it should be. Um, and so when we talk about testing, and this is again based on the IWCLL recommendations, and many of us feel strongly about that, um, that cytogenetics or FISH should absolutely be tested. I think this is a must. Um, if it's not tested at diagnosis, it absolutely needs to be tested before somebody starts therapy. Okay, so, so let's say somebody's monitored for 10 years, fine. But if you're gonna, if somebody says to you, you need some therapy, it's important to, the know, to, it's important to know what the cytogenetics are, what people's chromosomal abnormalities are. And I'm gonna show you why, because that absolutely does influence treatment, okay? Um, the other thing that comes up, so that's in particular, we always talk about the 17P or the TP53 mutation. And that's why we're talking about that, is that that testing is important because clearly there's, we, we have data, very good data, that certain therapies probably shouldn't be used for that subgroup, and there are much better therapies. And that's why that testing becomes so relevant. Um, mutational testing, so this so-called IGVH mutational testing, I think is also very important, so we do recommend that as well. And I'm gonna show you why I think those are important. So if you're gonna have, there's a ton of markers that would, can be done on patients with CLL, but in, at least for practice changing purposes, for you know, what we do that may influence treatment recommendations, the minimum people should have is FISH and IGBH. And again, I know that's not done across the board, and I'll show you some data. Imaging always comes up. People always ask about imaging. Should you know, that be standard in terms of testing? Um, it is not, uh, we do not mandate that imaging is done, uh, uh, you, you know, unless there's a clinical reason. I, obviously in clinical trials, we do all of this, but that's a separate issue. Um, but in terms of, you know, I try to do at least a minimum baseline imaging before somebody gets therapy, but at diagnosis, do I think it's necessary? No, unless somebody's concerned or they have a complaint and something needs to be chased, okay? So at, the, so at the minimum before somebody starts any therapy, I think cytogenetics and molecular testing should be done on patients because it's gonna influence therapy and I'll show you why. Uh, next slide. Are we stuck? Thank you. Okay, fine. So I, I want to say one thing because I know that people get caught up on this. And so even though I'm going to talk about these in more detail, uh, all these tests are, you know, prognostic markers in general, they, there is some limitations of, of this. And as I said, it's an evolution. As I, there are lots of things we can test for in our CLL patients. What is relevant, I'm gonna focus on those two things that I told you about, uh, but what you know, people always get, you know, when we do testing in the doctor's office and, and we read about CLL, am I this, am I this, am I this, am I this, uh, you, know, you might have a 17P or P53 mutation. That does not mean, yes, we know that that's more aggressive, so on and so forth, but that doesn't mean you need treatment yet or right away. And so again, I wanna caution that this testing is important, particularly when we are about to initiate therapy, but you, you need to understand that your tempo of your disease should trump all of this. Just if you are, you know, if you have a, a, a on paper you look bad, does not mean that everybody on paper needs therapy. So I've had some 17P patients I've followed for over five years. There's something different about their biology. We just don't understand it yet. So you can have prognostic markers. The, the testing is important, but you still, when you need therapy, that's, you know, it's relevant 
that is when you impact what treatment you're getting. But not everybody behaves the same, and having uh, a 17P doesn't mean that you should be treated tomorrow. Does that make sense? So prognostic markers do have their limitations, um, and we all need to respect that, that um, it's, you know, where you are. It, it, it tells you, you know, which curve you're on, but it doesn't tell you exactly when. Okay, so I want, I want that. Until we get more specific, until we find things that are, are, are better, where we can really be predictive of if you have this, 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 and this, this means this tells you approximately here is when you're going to start therapy, great. But, you know, there's a curve, and everybody falls differently on the bell curve. So I just want to stress that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so again, testing flow, cytometry, so people need to confirm their diagnosis. Everybody could do this off the blood. Cytogenetics and molecular testing, I think, is a must. CAT scans, not necessarily unless there are symptoms. PET scans can be helpful. So if somebody has a lot of symptoms and you're worried about transformation to a large cell lymphoma, that's where we use a PET scan. But do I think everybody needs scans? Absolutely not. Okay. It helps guide us if somebody's very sick and we're worried about that possibility, a PET scan will help guide us if we need a biopsy but otherwise it should not be done routinely. And a bone marrow, now that all our testing is done via peripheral blood, you know, typically you know, we don't necessarily do bone marrow as a diagnosis um, unless there's a reason to do it. So if there are cytopenias, if the counts are low, you're about to start therapy and the counts are low and the doctor do a bone marrow, I, I still do bone marrow all the time. So bone marrow, I think I, I do them, not so doctors have moved away from doing them, but if I'm gonna start somebody on therapy, I do a bone marrow. And I particularly do it with the autoimmune cytopenias because I might finesse treatment a little differently by adding an antibody depending, uh, but that's me, okay. Uh, move forward. So again, let's let's pass through this. Okay. So in terms of the molecular, um, the reason why I think this this is one of these is important is we we this is going to get to treatment is that the mutational status is important because we know that patients who are mutated do better. Patients who are unmutated, their time to their first treatment is sooner. They do have an inferior survival, and there's a higher risk of Richter's transformation. Okay, um, and previously we used to do a lot of ZAP70 testing, and depending upon the lab, we had difficulties with reproducibility of ZAP70 testing. So we've moved away from ZAP70 testing, and so the IGVH really correlates with ZAP70. With ZAP so I think again, cytogenetics and molecular testing are important for you guys, and let's show you some of that data. Move forward. Okay. Cytogenetics, so the fish that we talked about in terms of the chromosomal abnormalities. Now this is in the era of chemoimmunotherapy. So the curves, again, when we talked about 17P, that's the green right here. These folks had the poor survival. These curves have now shifted all because of novel therapies. Okay, so not only for the good features, but for patients with 17P. So this is why this is important. Move forward. P53 and TP53 uh, deletions or mutations, again, we know that those folks who have those mutations or deletions do worse than folks who do not. Uh, and again, it's a, you know, it doesn't, it's just really just to show you graphically, um, but the point is, is that these mutations do matter and knowing about them matters. Move forward. And for the mutational status, this is why it matters. Again, patients who are mutated do better than those who do not. Okay, and so this is important. I'll show you why. Okay. So I, it, when we, we're going to talk about data right now, and I tried to keep this very basic, um, but again, I, I think fish should be standard of care, both at initial presentation, or again, if not when you're first diagnosed, prior to starting therapy, um, and at relapse, and, and relapse is, and the reason why, so if you need other therapy down the road, your fish, your cytogenetics can change. People can acquire a 17P or a P53. That becomes important to know. Um, and so it should be tested again. The IGVH status really doesn't change. You're either mutated or you're not. So if you got it tested once, that's fine. Um, so you know what you are. Um, and so it should be tested at least once by minimum. Fast forward, next slide. So now when we look at folks, we're, we're talking about both. We're talking about fitness status, so that's relevant, even with the novel agents, because we could be choosy even with the side effects of the novel agents, and cytogenics. So now we have therapies that really can address both issues for all comers, again, young, fit, older, more frail, high risk, low risk, 
therapies can address many of these patients. And so there's no reason why we should partition out just by somebody who's old and frail. Everybody's got access to good therapy, should have access to good therapy now for CLL. Okay, next slide. This was the data I was talking about from the U.S., so this is only U.S. Um, so myself and many others participated in our CLL registry. Um, we have now many registries, hopefully um, across the globe, that look at CLL patients. And so this was looking at about 1,500 patients with CLL. Just looked at testing. You know, what do oncologists in the U.S. do? Um, and this is what they call LOT1, LOT2. These are lines of therapy. So for patients getting their first line of therapy, then their second line and third line and so on, you know, what was testing like? Who, how many patients got tested? And not surprising to the docs who do CLL, so not surprising to us, but disappointing to us is that, you know, the good news is about 50% of patients do get testing of cytogenetics and fish and molecular, but that's not everybody. And so we were disappointed because we felt, you know what, this is one of the things, and this is why I lecture, um, is because one of the things we do across the U.S. is I try to educate doctors about CLL because it's not their bread and butter. Their bread and butter is solid tumors. Let's be honest. I only treat CLL. It's unfair. <laughs> no, it's beautiful for us, but it's not, it's not fair. So, so it's important because the oncologists don't to keep up. And oncology, not just CLL, is exploding. The drugs in solid tumors, breast, lung, I mean, you think about it. Um, the, to keep up with what's going on in oncology. Two more minutes. See? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Oh, <laughs> 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 gone. Move. Have time for discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Right. Next slide. Yeah. So the point is that people aren't getting testing, and they should. And they get tested even less in subsequent lines of therapy. Move on. Okay. FCR, still good therapy. Good in mutated folks. Unmutated, we'd move away. So this is where that's relevant. Years ago, we didn't know this. If you are unmutated, we move away from chemoimmunotherapy now. That's why that's important. That's why you should be tested. Mutated could still get FCR. Fast forward. Same as uh, 17P. FCR, not good for 17P. Fast forward. <laughs> That's why. Okay. <laughs> FCR, okay, again, if you are unmutated, not as good. So again, moving away from chemoimmunotherapy for the unmutated. Next slide. So FCR is still good for young, fit, mutated folks? Yes. BR, same thing. Young or older, fit, mutated? BR is still good. Chemo is still good for mutated. Fine. Well, how has ASH changed that? So our big meeting that we had in December, fast forward. FCR versus abrutinib-based therapy. So that's FCR. For finally, a randomized study looking at FCR versus abrutinib. For mutated, both are good. For unmutated, abrutinib is better. Novel therapy is better for the unmutated. That's where we're moving. Fast forward. Overall survival looks good. Okay, about equal. So we need longer follow-up on these therapies. That's where that is. Next slide. Fast forward. Venetoclax just got approved frontline. Venetoclax have been a tuzumab in the U.S. This is actually the German CLL data. So this is, you know, the international national trial that everybody ran. Uh, Venetoclax have been a tuzumab uh, better than chlorambucil. By P53 status, you could see, obviously better than chlorambucil based therapy. And for those who are mutated or unmutated, those guys now are even. So if you are unmutated, you all of a sudden are doing better with the newer therapies. You're, you're, you're now getting to, you're the mutated and unmutated are overlapping. That's great. That's the point. So you're trying to get those folks and get them better therapy so everybody does better. Fast forward. So, which patients are still suitable for chemoimmunotherapy? In the U.S., in my mind, it's the folks who are mutated without a 17P. You guys can still get chemoimmunotherapy. If you are unmutated, we move away. If you have a 17P, for sure, you get a novel agent. Fast forward. So when we look at, and this is an evolving schema. I've adapted this from others. We're all adapting this. So when we separate, and this is the last slide. When we separate folks, we're looking at what's your, what's your cytogenetics? Do you have a TP53 or a P53 mutation? Are you high risk? Are you mutated or are you not mutated? If you are not mutated, 
Um, and um, you, you obviously, you know, if you're unmutated, then you really should go to the novel therapies. If you're mutated, then we can look at fitness scores. Uh, and you have availability of a lot more options of therapy. That includes chemoimmunotherapy, novel agents, all across the board if you're mutated and you don't have a 17P. If you have a 17P or a TP53, you need novel therapy. That's why testing is important. Because as we learn about you folks and the cohorts of the different diseases and separate individuals, we're finding out what therapies are better for what different cohorts. Hopefully we'll find a cure and then this will all be irrelevant. Right? But until that time, we have better therapies we can pick and choose. And we can pick and choose better for you now. That's why testing is important. That's why we should advocate testing for all patients, no matter what part of the world they're from. I'm done. <laughs>